Okay, um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and a very warm welcome um, to everyone for this week's webinar on managing mental health in the workplace. My name is Vicky Cockman and I am the workplace lead at Mental Health First Aid England. Just to let you know, this is a repeat webinar session um, from the one we ran um, a couple of weeks ago. So you may have already seen some of this um, content if you did join us back then. I am delighted to be joined by Olive Lewis, Matt Roberts and Andy Ward, who will introduce themselves shortly. And we will be and they will be sharing their expert insights on the theme of line managers and managing mental health at work. Before we kick off, a reminder that the Q&A function is open. So if you have a question, please don't hesitate to pop it in the box. My colleague Alex will be supporting and answering your questions directly. And hopefully we will have the opportunity to answer some of those questions with the panel later on in the session. So in today's session, we are going to discuss best practice for line managers in supporting employees' mental health, adapting support for remote working and changing circumstances, and covering the importance of self-care and ensuring that you're not pouring from an empty cup. So I'm gonna go over to the panel to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. So if Olive, I can start with you. Hi, good afternoon, Vicky. Good afternoon to everyone. For those who I can see and those who I can't see. Um, my name is Olive Lewis. I am an accredited mental health first data. I have been practicing since 2010. So that's like over 10 years. Um, I have worked in both voluntary and statutory settings. I have just been working with men, South London and Waterloo for the last 15 years in mental health setting. Um, my background is in social work training. And at the moment, I'm working with a group of other mental health first aiders who are looking at um, creating a programme on race and mental health for mental health first aiders. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Olive. And Matt, if I can come to you next. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, really glad to be here with you today. I'm Matt Roberts. I'm the Director of Membership for the Chartered Management Institute. And um, ensuring that managers and leaders across organisations have both the confidence and the skills to help support mental health of their teams is absolutely vital in terms of the, the role we play at the CMI. And we're, we're absolutely delighted to partner with Mental Health First Aid um England across a whole range of different activities and really pleased to be invited to join you today thank you brilliant thanks Matt and Andy if I can come to you yes of course thanks Vicky and hi everyone um so I'm Andy Ward I'm the operational lead for uh, the UK and EMEA at Deutsche Bank for our corporate bank people strategy uh, I'm also one of the leads for the well-being and mental health first aid program uh, at Deutsche Bank for the UK um, I'm also someone with lived experience of, uh, of mental health challenges, having um, taken some extended time away from work a few years back. Um, and at the moment, I'm doing a lot of work um, within Deutsche Bank to, to improve the, the knowledge and the skills of managers when uh, dealing with the mental health and well-being of themselves, but also and their teams, uh, especially at this time of remote working and split operations. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. So I think we know that managers are critical to creating successful, profitable and mentally healthy workplaces. And we believe that giving managers the tools to support themselves and their teams is crucial. With the change of many teams now working remotely and with physical workspaces probably going to, going to be looking very different in the near future, we now need to reflect on what managers need to feel confident um, to support their team's well-being. I'd like to open up our first poll and hear from the audience. Um, so the question we'd like to ask is how confident are you that the managers in your organisation have the skills to start a conversation about mental health with their team members? So I'm just going to give you 30 seconds um, just to vote on the poll and then we'll take a look at the results. Brilliant. And if we can just take a look at the results of that poll. So we've got 8% feeling very confident, 48% somewhat confident, 
27% somewhat unconfident and 12% very unconfident with 5% um, not sure. So, so when we did this poll last time, we had 60% um, of the audience thought that managers were somewhat or very unconfident. So we, we've actually seen a, a shift in, in people feeling um, in the audience today that 48% are somewhat confident, which seems more of an encouraging result. Olive, if I can come to you first, um, wh why do you think we're seeing the results that we're seeing in terms of kind of, I guess, 50% are somewhat confident and, and others feeling less so? Sorry. <laughs> um, I think things, things have changed dramatically. I think COVID has thrown people into a pit where you have to look at things in different ways. And I think managers have been put in that situation now where they have to look at how best can they support their staff so there's been a lot i feel there's been a lot more contact for managers with its staff whereas before you had an office an open office and you could just go away and come back coming out whereas now you really have to set time up for your staff so the important things around taking time out and i think also managers are realizing themselves that they actually may have issues um for them so that they have to deal with and so in terms of looking after yourself you also have to look after your staff as well Brilliant, thank you, Olive. And Andy, if I can come to you, how important is the role of the line manager within a workplace when supporting employee mental health? And, and what are your reflections on these results? Yeah, I, I think um, I think now more than ever, um, it's critically important, right? I think managers always need to remember that uh, as well as the, the business targets they may have, that the general team targets they've got, they also have a duty of care for anyone essentially that they are managing. Um, I, I agree, right? It's it's um, it's it's really good to see that since the last time we did this, which I think was around a month ago, that those those results have shifted. And I think personally, I'm seeing it as one of the very few uh, positives that have come um, from the pandemic, right? I think we've been thrown into a situation where we have no choice but to make sure that we are all okay and actually speaking to each other regularly in in absence of of usual social physical contact, right? I think that. You know, the, the concept of, of communication has, has come on leaps and bends in, in the last couple of months. And I think, you know, personally, I think I've spoken to not just my teams and, and my manager, but also my friends and my family more in the past four or five months than probably the, the, the four or five years leading up to that. Um, and I think that, yeah, managers play a, a critical role in ensuring that not only are they checking in and making sure that their teams are OK and that they're, they're working to their best, but also being able to have the skill set to be able to spot the signs for when a, a team member may not be uh, performing at their best, but also may not be uh, actively discussing that fact. Brilliant, thank you, Andy. Um, and yeah, I, I completely agree. I think ma managers play such a, a key role in, in having the opportunity to, to spot those signs and being able to signpost people to, um, to support and, and support on that road to recovery if needed. So Matt, if I can um, come to you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these results and, and your reflections on what you think the key things are that line managers need to feel confident to have a conversation. Yeah, thanks Vicky. Well, I, I think that the, the points that Olive and Andy have made are, are excellent and I completely agree with, with all of the things that they've said. Um, it is encouraging to see more people being prepared to say that they're somewhat confident to open up these sorts of com conversations or that they feel that managers in their organisations are somewhat confident. I guess the, the thing that we're all ultimately aiming for is, is all of those managers to feel very confident uh, about discussing mental health with their team members. And, and like Andy, I, I do think that in a, in a strange way, the, uh, the situation that we've been plunged into this year has, I, I think probably in some cases, forced a number of managers and leaders to, to face into the fact that they do have that duty of care, that they do have that role uh, to check in with people around their mental health. Um, I think, you know, this comes on the back of a trend generally where I think mental health literacy was starting to improve um, across our, our society. Um, but in, in many ways, I think this period has been an accelerant for that. I think that for managers and leaders, um, this is an ever-changing position though. So in the early days of the lockdown with the sort of everybody thrown into this sort of working from home and in many cases using these sorts of communication tools much more regularly if not for the first time uh, in their lives so i think there was an element at that stage where perhaps people felt well we're all in this together we've got to sort of muddle through 
And, and I guess there was a danger at that point that people, whether they were managers or not, would start to neglect some of the self-care aspects, which I know we'll talk about later. I think as time has evolved, um, there's now a much greater responsibility on managers to, to do more though. I think they've got to start looking out for those signs of where people are really fatigued by the fact that perhaps they've been isolated for a long period of time away from friends and family. Perhaps they're missing the social interaction that work brings into their life. Um, and so I think there's a definite need to make sure that the confidence continues to grow to open up the conversations, but also the observational skills of managers and leaders improve so that actually they can, they can spot those signs early on. And, you know, simple things like just ensuring that um, as well as having regular one-to-ones with your team members, but always starting that conversation with a well-being based question. Um, you know, simple things like that um, are really easy to adopt. Um, now, not everybody will be forthcoming immediately, of course, but actually the more that managers do those sorts of things and start to perhaps actually also just expose some of their own vulnerabilities, that will build trust and it will build authenticity. Uh, and those things are vitally important if people are going to open up and, and just say, hey, look, I am struggling here. Uh, I need some help. So I, I think it's a changing situation, but it's, it's really encouraging to see those, uh, those poll results. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. And, and yeah, I mean, to, to your point around integrating it into to one to ones, it's, it, that's something that we do at MHFA England um, to, to kickstart the conversation with a, how are you? How are you feeling at the moment? And, and, and it does, I think, shift the focus into making sure that you're concentrating on the person um, rather than the, the output. So thank you all for your um, reflections on that. Um, I, I'd love to take us to the next poll question, if that's OK. Um, so the second question that we have for the audience today is, how do you feel the pandemic has affected the mental health of employees at your organisation? So I'm just going to give you 30 seconds again, if you could um, vote on this poll and then we'll reflect on the results. Brilliant. And if we can see the poll results of the second poll. So interestingly, um, nobody feels that um, there has been a very positive, um, their mental health has had a very positive um, change um, due to the pandemic, which I think was actually the same as um, the results as when we did it last time. 8% somewhat positively, 23% sitting with neutral, 62% so the highest coming out somewhat negatively and 7% very negatively. Matt, I'd like to come back to you um, to hear your thoughts on this. What, what concerns have your people had during this period and how have your organisations been supporting them during this time? Yeah, I, I, I think I personally I recognise those results. Um, you know, I think there, there are one or two positive aspects to the changes that have been um, you know, enforced upon us through this circumstance. But I, I think that if we were talking to colleagues and, and indeed members of CMI, we would see a, a similar pattern to, to what's reflected in the poll. Um, I think that, you know, the, the perspectives obviously vary from individual to individual in terms of the, the impact on them. I, I do think that there is um, a feel um, that, the, you know, there's an ongoing sort of shift now happening, as I mentioned earlier, with people starting perhaps to feel a little bit more prepared to talk about some of the challenges that they are facing uh, and perhaps putting aside the, the bigger picture. And I, I think that's healthy, by the way. I think that's a very positive step forward. Um, in terms of our organisation, um, one of the things that we have tried to do um, is to uh, give a level of certainty to our people. And so uh, whilst we're in you know, a very uncertain world right now, there are things that managers and leaders can do that will, will help just to alleviate some of that. And, and that may well make a, a, a beneficial difference. Um, so, for example, 
Um, we made a decision very early in the crisis that we, we wouldn't reopen our, our office spaces initially at least until September and we've, we've now extended that until at least the, uh, the new calendar year. And you know, whilst that in some ways for some people is daunting, for the majority of our, our people, they actually welcome that level of certainty. Um, and it's just one less thing to sort of speculate about and wonder, you know, am I going to be safe if I do have to travel to work and what will that look like and so forth. Um, there are a number of other things that we've, we've looked to facilitate as well. Though. So, for example, we've instigated uh, more regular communications across the organisation. So where we used to have a monthly staff meeting, we now have a weekly uh, Q&A session with our CEO, uh, which has been really popular. Um, and it's not just about the sort of business organisational stuff. We, we look to introduce some fun elements. So we've done sort of mini competitions earlier in the year when the weather was great saying, you know, show us you know, the, the best of your garden or the best DIY project that you've done. And just a bit of fun like that can make such a difference. We've more recently implemented things like uh, Zoom-based Pilates classes for, for our staff team to, to take part in if they wish. And I, th I think that sort of blend of, of different activities is, is an important aspect in, in this. Um, but again, I think um, you know, leaders really need to make sure that they keep vigilant. And I guess one of the things that, in my personal view, we saw with the, the sort of lockdown phase was initially there's quite a lot of decisive stuff coming out of government about what could and couldn't be done. But then over the, perhaps the second sort of phase of the period since the lockdown, that's become less and less the case. And as that uncertainty is built, I think that's probably had an impact. So I think managers, if they can get ahead of that and create some level of certainty, it can only be of benefit. Brilliant, thanks, Matt. And Olive, if I can come to you, um, what are your reflections on these results and are you surprised that the majority feel kind of that there's been a, a negative effect? No not really I think a lot of people are really confused about what is right and what is not right and you find people are more cautious with one another workers are more cautious even though they're kind of one another they're cautious about should I talk to that person or should I not to that person if they have to go in the front line staff if they have to go into work is that person being tested? Has that person not been tested? Am I safe? Because these people may be having to look out, go home and look after family. And so particularly within the black community, because when you hear on the news that a lot of people in the BME communities are dying because of frontline staff, it makes that fear come up even further. And I think people are actually wanting to stay away a lot more rather than go to work. What Matt was saying around what I found in the organization where we have an open space as well, where staff can actually tune into, they can actually have a conversation where, without being fear of being reprimanded anyway about what's going on for them. And um, as well, and that SLAM that I'm talking about, South London and Maudsley, and they also say that staff shouldn't come in unless they really have to, to stay safe. So this poll, it, it is really quite frightening because we're in an area that people are not quite sure what is happening and you're expected to get on with your work and expected to do and particularly staff who have to go into work like um people who collect the rubbish you know you've got you, um, you, uh, people in the kitchen people have to clean the offices you have people who um um cows in offices who are going out front line for them it's like they're going out there and they're not quite sure what's happening you have the care workers in the homes you have people on the wards so because people are having to still go in there is a lot of fear about is it going to be me? Yeah, and what can I do? So I'm not surprised about that at all. Uh, I think it, it's it, the society as a whole, I think it actually mimics, mimics basically what's going on for people, basically, and the general mm -hmm. note. Great, thank you, Olive. If I can come to you, Andy, um, have you seen the role of the line manager change with teams working remotely? And have, have there, has there been any feedback from line managers in terms of the additional support that's needed to support mental health during this time? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, more than anything else, line managers are finding themselves in situations much more often where they're, they're forced to confront the quote unquote difficult conversation, right? I think when the world was as it was prior to the pandemic, I think the, the concept of a, a well-being conversation, a mental health conversation, they were much more few and far between. I think in the past few months, um, and especially actually we're noticing in the past few weeks, those conversations are becoming much more 
uh, frequent and, and much more relevant as well. Um, I think some of the things we're noticing is uh, the concept of the double negative right now. So at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were all first sort of forced into lockdown and, and working remotely, there was, there was an element of, you know, it was new, it was something different, right? It was a little bit of fun to an extent, and people were kind of relishing the fact that they were able to spend more time at home. And I think what we're seeing now is that that fatigue has really started to kick in, um, the concept of not having the, the regular social interaction. It's really starting to bite simply because the novelty of, of working from home may be wearing off for a number of people. Coupled with that, um, I think a lot of people actually still have concerns around not necessarily returning to the office itself, because I know, you know, my company and lots of other companies, they're doing a huge amount of work to ensure that the office is a safe place to come back to. But I think more than anything, it's the commute, right? It's the, it's the leaving the house and getting into the office. I think ultimately, if everybody was given their own personal helicopter, I think everybody would be absolutely fine with going back into an office space. Um, an interesting thing I, uh, that I've seen, and, and, and a personal one for me as well, right, is that I think that the mindset of individuals, the personality types of individuals has a big part to play here. Um, and just reading some of the, the comments that are coming in through the Q&A, it's an absolutely valid point. Um, those of us who, who are much more introverted or have a, a, you know, neurodiversity that means that they actually thrive in these kind of situations are probably doing much better than those who may have a, a much more extroverted personality or or really struggle with uh, with isolation because of circumstance. Um, the results of the poll, I think, absolutely reflect what the vast majority of, um, of the staff at my company, for example, would probably say. Um, but it's interesting that we don't, especially as line managers, we don't lose sight of the fact that there is no one answer to that question. Right? Within a team of five, you're likely to get five very, very different responses. Um, to a poll of this nature. And I think it's incumbent on line managers to make sure that if they don't feel that they have the skill set to be able to have those, kind, those types of very diverse conversations, um, that they're shouting about it, right? And we're seeing a lot of managers now putting their hands up and, and almost admitting, I think is a word I would use under advisement, right? Admitting the fact that their people skills may need a little bit of work and they're actively seeking to get that kind of training, that sort of that increase in those those types of skills to make sure that they're doing the very best for their employees because i mean ultimately you know we're all focused constantly on results and bottom line but if the the individuals who are required to do the job to deliver on those results aren't in a place where they feel safe or that they feel comfortable and they're not getting the support that they need then the managers need to make sure that they're shouting you know to their managers and to the organizations as a whole to really highlight the fact that this sort of skills training needs to be something that we don't see as a nice to have anymore and it should be it really should be bundled as part of the line manager responsibility brilliant thank you andy and and i i think to everybody mentioned the point of, of what kind of returning to work might look like and i think it's going to look very differently for a lot of organizations and for a lot of individuals and and one of the things that we actually de developed was our return to work and mental health um kind of skills course was to upskill HR managers in, in being able to um, respond to that really well um, and, and we've definitely seen a need of, of being able to do that. Um, that's brilliant thank you all so much for your um, reflections on that I'd just like to take the opportunity to say that if you do have a question um, for any of our panelists or for all of our panelists please feel free to put it in the Q&A box um, during the session as we will be going to a Q&A um, for the last kind of 10 minutes of the webinar today. Um, but I know you've been listening to us for a while, um, so I'm going to take us to our third and final poll of this we um, webinar session. Um, so the, quest the last question we have for you today is to what extent does your organisation promote self-care as a way of managing mental health and wellbeing? So I'm going to give you another 30 seconds um, just to vote on those results.
brilliant. And if we can see the results of that poll, So we have 19% saying their organisation very regularly promotes self-care, 32% somewhat regularly, 24% sometimes, 19% occasionally, and 7% never. Um, interestingly, that's very, very similar to the, um, within the 1% to 2% um, change from our results last time. So Andy, if I can come... Um, back to you and, and hear, hear your thoughts on that and, and specifically, I guess, around the role of the manager and self-care for themselves and their teams. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, it's, it's good to see that these, uh, these results are bearing a, a similar um, result to the matrix as we saw last time. Um, I think, you know, th there's a, a lot of conversation around um, making sure that managers don't try to pour from the empty cup. I know that's a, a phrase that MHV England use a lot. Another analogy that we've been discussing very recently is, is the concept of the, um, the oxygen mask on an airplane, right? If you have children and, and you know that, you know, they're the, the most precious uh, things that you have, you're still told, put your mask on first, right? You must make sure that you wear yours before helping others. And I think that's, that's a, a really simple analogy to use and one that seems to be working very well um, with individuals that we speak to is that, you know, ultimately there's a lot of expectation on managers to, to make sure that self-care is promoted amongst the teams. But if they're not practicing what they preach, um, it, it can be, uh, it can be something that hugely affects their teams, right? If, if they're seeing that their managers aren't necessarily taking care of themselves and they're allowing a situation to get the better of them, it's very difficult then as a, a member of a team who reports into that manager to be able to take it seriously yourself. Um, so it's something that we've been doing a lot of work on recently and, and trying to make sure that our managers are aware that as, as much as there is that, that incumbent responsibility on them to take care of their teams, it's also critically important that they are taking care of themselves and, and some would argue more so. Um, you know, as an individual who myself has, has been through those challenges, it's very easy to allow that, that, that area, that, that place that you eventually sort of end up in to, to sneak up on you. Um, and I think it takes an active and, and a willing um, want to, to recognize those signs and also to, to admit them to yourself. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, hurdles in, in talking about mental health is, is the concept of admitting it. Um, and actually, arguably that it's the, the biggest most important step but also it should be one of the easiest but i think it's something that as individuals we struggle to take um from what we've seen um you know recently especially what we've, we've done lots of sort of poll surveys and, and and asking our staff how they are and how their managers are coping things are, are, are much better i think than we would uh, we would have assumed uh, in this situation and actually what's really good is that we're, we're seeing lots more managers who are relying on each other to share best practice, to share what's working, to share situations where they haven't necessarily been comfortable and how they've dealt with it. And, and basically just to help each other to work to a, a common goal, really, both in terms of taking care of their teams, but also in terms of taking care of themselves. And if I could just real quickly, just pick up on something that Matt said in the previous answer around, you know, the activities that people may want to get involved in. And I would, I would always um, stress never to underestimate the power of, um, of social interaction with teams. Um, we've seen a, a, a huge increase in the number of teams that now get together, um, whether it's on a Zoom call or, or whatever it is, but ultimately just come together for, for half an hour, for an hour at the end of a day, just to talk about anything that isn't related to work. Um, I was on a call recently, which was basically 45 minutes of people ribbing each other about the recent Champions League results. But what that does, of course, is that it brings back that social interaction, that, that area that time really that we can spend with each other as human beings and i think those kind of conversations then ultimately lead to a, a much more safe space where people can talk about how they're feeling and not feel like they're going to be judged for it um, and i think you know as managers i think that's a, a critically important one to not also not only sorry to, to have the buy-in of your team um to sort of you know to be able to talk about anything but also to show that that caring, that level of caring is there, both in terms of a manager taking care of themselves and allowing themselves to blow off a little steam, but also to show that, you know, they want their teams to take care of themselves as well. Brilliant, thanks Andy. And, and what, what do you think are kind of the, the key things that are, are possibly preventing managers from having the conversations and, and, and I guess opening the conversation around mental health with their teams? 
I think some of it is around confidence. And as I've said previously, right, around the, the skill sets that, that are required to actively have those conversations. Some managers I've spoken to feel that they don't, they don't particularly feel like they are qualified to have those types of conversations if they haven't got lived experience themselves, which I think is a really interesting point. Um, I think also the fact that, you know, especially as we went into the pandemic, everybody was focusing on how are we going to deliver on what we need to deliver based on this new way of working. I think that the stresses, you know, that the stresses, that the demands of the workplace whilst also trying to balance remote working with a, with a split team. I think that, you know, ultimately as, as we do, human nature, I guess, around work is that we tend to focus more on the deliverables that are on paper rather than the deliverables around making sure that the team is healthy and working well and efficient. Um, and I think things are st definitely starting now to, to shift more in the other direction. People are taking the time to make sure that when they have their one-to-ones and they have any kind of group meetings that they are spending time just talking as a group to, to make sure that people are okay, to highlight any issues um, that may have come about and also to, to just temperature check, right? If there's a particular issue that's been bothering someone or, or bothering a group of people to make sure that it's brought to light and those conversations are actually being held. And, and finally, I think one of the key things that we try to do and, and have done a lot more of recently and plan to do further is, is not underestimating, underestimating the power of personal story. Um, we've, we've seen, you know, where we have peaks in the number of people that want to sign up to become a mental health first aider, for example, usually follows um, a, an article or a video or a podcast that we've done where someone in a, in a position of leadership has actually spoken about a challenge that they've had in their time or, or a particular situation that they were faced with and how they dealt with it. And telling those personal stories, really sort of having the opportunity to show the human side um, of, of a senior leader or a manager. Um, goes a huge way to to creating that again that that safe space that place where people do feel like they can have these types of conversations um, and something that i would urge everybody to to give a try in, in their organization brilliant thanks andy matt if i can come to you next um to firstly share your thoughts on the results but also um if there's anything you can share around how do line managers kind of really role model good self-care for their teams as well well, yeah, thanks, Vicky. Um, yeah, I, I think um, as uh, as Andy mentioned, the the results are generally encouraging from the poll. That you know there, there seems to be a, a large swathe of organisations that are encouraging self care amongst their teams. That's that's really good to uh, to observe. Again, we want to get your, all of the answers to be as close to the top of that sort of uh, graph as possible. Um, I think um, I think in terms of uh, self care um, and the way in which managers can role model that. I think that term is incredibly important, and and I think again that's an area where the uh, the managers and leaders in that community need to be very very aware of themselves. You know, self awareness is a massive trait that is, is hugely important to the effectiveness of any manager or leader. And you know, first and foremost, I think everything that Andy has said about the importance of self care is is spot on. Um, and so I'm not going to focus on why self-care is important. But the role modeling aspect, um, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and in my experience working at CMI, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, our CEO stood up in front of all our staff and talked about flexible working and what it meant for her. And, and one of the ways in which uh, it manifests, actually, is in things like one-to-one -one discussions. So it's not unusual when I have a one-to-one -one with her that she will actually be walking in the park um, and she's on the phone to me. If anything, we have a better quality discussion because she's free from other work-related distractions. Um, and frankly, we get a better quality discussion out of it, but as well as being productive. Uh, that is one of her ways. It's a personal choice, but it's one of her ways of looking after her own well-being. And I think actually telling that story, just in the way that Andy's explained the, the power of telling story, is a great way of sort of role modeling and almost not that people need permission but i think sometimes subconsciously there is that feeling of oh i can't do that i can't exercise that flexibility because what will somebody else think about it so i think um you know having leaders that are prepared to share their experiences and their own views on all sorts of things but you know flexible working would be just one aspect uh is vitally important um interestingly in, in recent weeks um I think there's, there's been other opportunities to really role models. So, 
two weeks of annual leave and I really became conscious just during that break. Um, and actually, like a couple of years ago, I had a, a mental health challenge and it led to this time of work. Superb support from my boss and my colleagues. I was very, very lucky. Um, but it does make me more aware of what I need to do around self-care. But I think I'd let some of the things slip there because of the, the chaos of COVID. And I had a period of working without taking days off that was far, far longer than I'd ever dream of considering if we'd have been working in the office, for the usual commute and so on and so forth. Um, so I think actually it's, it's quite important that, that leaders are not um, feeling beholden to the organisation so much that they don't do things like take holidays, such a basic thing in any other year. Um, but you know, keep an eye on whether your people are taking holidays. Um, and I think the the other thing that I would say to role modelling is that again it, it's starting to change. You know, this this evolution is is, is coming. So for organisations, you know, where they are returning to the physical space where they operate, whether that's a, an office, a factory, or whatever it may be, um, I think leaders really need to role model effectively there. And, and I was talking this morning with a colleague about this. And this isn't just about the people who are leading the organisation being in the office as some kind of symbolism. In actual fact, it's probably the opposite of that. And it's actually about leaders showing that actually as part of my health, and my, my self-care, I'm going to make very choiceful decisions about whether I do commute, whether I do travel in, uh, because I can be just as effective working from home as I could be in the office. Um, but I could either be at risk myself or creating a risk for others if I do travel. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting paradox there in terms of, I guess, in many situations we think about people leading from the front and leading by example. Um, and it might not be the obvious example they need to set in order to encourage self-care. Brilliant, thank you, Matt. And Olive, if I can come to you um, in terms of, in terms of the results and, and would love to hear your thoughts on it but do, do you think focus on self-care has significantly shifted um in terms of the current circumstances i think it's shifted i think um people need to give themselves permission to shift i think we're human and we're, we're creatures and we do the same thing of habit but unless the miss says it's okay we're not going to do that i think one of the challenges for managers as well even though they're managing they still think there's an expectation that I have to do. I think what Matt was saying, I've got to be on top. I've got to be doing this. I've got to do that. Well, you, you might not know about IT. You might not never, as you talk, communicated with your staff as often. You may not have had contact with people because you're rushing and you, you delegated the work down. So until we stop and say, because as you were saying, I was thinking, as Matt was talking, thinking, there's a song saying, I'm only human after all. I don't know who sings it, but I know there's a song right there. there. And, um, it is about being human because I think this is what COVID and um, working from home has done. That's made you to tap into areas that you probably put to one side and thought you didn't need. And we're trying to have a work-life home balance, whereas now we're working from home, where's the balance? And so until you give yourself permission, until you actually say, um, have a strict routine within yourself, because for myself, I still get up like I'm going to work. I may not do, I may do the whole thing as I'm going to work, because if I don't, it's quite easy for me to slouch down and think, oh, forget it. And I think when you're trying to juggle that and you might have a, a child here, a cat here, an elder person here, you're trying to care in different ways, it's really hard. And um, again, what was said, I think it is from the top downwards. And it's not just from line management, I'm talking from the sales all the way down. If you're not showing your staff that you're caring about them, if you're not showing that you're caring about yourself, if you're not showing how you can actually, um, people can get support, um, then it, staff will be, be feeling disillusioned. And if we look at the state of where, where things are at the moment, people don't want to be left on their own. People are work, living by themselves, as I just said. People are, have got no one to care for them. So they leave, they're reaching out to their line manager. If their line manager or their manager think, oh, just get on with it without caring for them, it, they're going to feel really unwell. And isolated and alone and I think one of the challenges we need to be doing is actually reach out more I think Matt said that um, and Andrew both said it that having more socials just to say hi how are you doing yeah is a positive thing that managers can do it doesn't have to be to be work and it doesn't have to be often 
I think I saw someone was somebody saying, if they're out in the streets, how do they get support? You can put build something in where the manager can just phone up and say, just checking in, how are you doing? Okay, bye. Or have a set time each day that staff connect with one another, particularly if you're out there all the time, because you, it's, it's like when you're alone working, if you're alone working by yourself, you have something set up where you can actually contact with that staff if they're safe. How do you know they're safe? How do you know something hasn't happened to them and what the baggage they have? And I think one of the other things as well, as we're working, people are not able to see one another. So we're having deaths that are happen, happening. And from a community that um, when somebody dies, you actually go there. In fact, you actually bury them so that the, um, under the grave diggers don't have to do anything. Whereas now, I'd have to watch it on Zoom or you're being told you can't come. So people are feeling traumatized, stressed. So the managers are not showing that um, they have an understanding or the managers are not even looking after themselves because obviously managers will have been going through that as well. Some of the similar traumas that everybody else is going. It's going to have a major impact and it's important for us to take a step back, look at our mass up and just, as I said, breathe. Just a quick quote from Maya, Maya Angelou who said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So as managers, we have the opportunity, or managers have the opportunity to impart that onto us, their staff and say, this is how I want to be treated. I'm going to give it back to my staff as well. So. Amazing. Thank you, Olive. And agree, an extremely powerful quote um, to to. to to finish with that so thank you so much and um, i think in terms of the conversation around um i guess role modeling and good self-care i would love to hear from the panelists um in terms of what what does your good self-care look like for you and what what do you enjoy in terms of being able to look after yourself so i'm going to come to olive first and ask what your best self-care tips are for the audience today okay well i do a lot of crafting i'll take time out i've just moved out of london so I do a lot of stuff to do some walking. I spend time with my son. I spend time with my, my mom because we're living in the same house. And I'm on Zoom. I've got girlfriends who I contact with and other friends who I contact on a regular basis. And we also have a session where we just talk about issues. So the elephant in the room, put that on the table and have a conversation about it. Because when you look at somebody's face for 10 or an hour, right, you, that's all you've got to look at. And so therefore it's like, okay, you're looking in their eyes, you're looking all around. So it's like, how can I check in with them? And you look at, and you have this laughter and, you, and just share things with each other. So for me, laughter is a massive, a big business. If you laugh, if you can laugh at yourself, if you can laugh with somebody, if you can laugh with a stranger, that breaks down that barrier, that, that feeling, that physical illness and enables you to move a lot further. So yeah, I do a lot of activities though, craft stuff that keeps me going. Brilliant, thank you, Olive. Matt, over to you. What are your best self-care tips? Um, I guess I'm a bit of a cliche, unfortunately, Vicky. So um, for me, I, I love getting out and cycling. And I, I know that's something that uh, so many people are doing these days. Um, and I, I had a bit of a moment early in the lockdown period where I knew I wanted to get out on the bike and I kept finding excuses not to do it. And it only took one sort of, sort of, to borrow and kick up my own backside to get me out there to then realise the benefits of it immediately and I got into a nice pattern of, uh, of getting out there again and, and felt so much better for it and so much fresher actually when I came back to focus on work related stuff and, and I think generally a bit better to be around at home as well so um, so that's big, that's big for me and um, you know I just think that you know the minute you start underestimating the importance of it is, is the minute that things creep up on you and it, we've all got to keep working at that Excellent. Thanks, Matt. And Andy, over to you. What does your self-care look like? Uh, it's interesting, actually, since the last time we did this. So I, I've recently moved house, um, which I don't in any way suggest anyone trying to do during a pandemic. It's, it's not fun. Um, but what that's allowed me to do is it's allowed me to rekindle my love for decorating and carpentry. Um, so, you know, having spent 15 years in, in financial services, I actually grew up in, in a builder's household um, and spent a lot of time as a, as a school-aged child cutting random pieces of wood for no other reason than it was fun. Um, and actually what I've, I've been doing recently, you know, I built a, like a bay window seat, for example, just because we had a big space and I thought I'd build a bay window seat. And it really 
connected me again with that feeling of happiness around wood as I was when I was a child. And so I've now decided to build a summer house at the end of the summer, which is an obvious time um, to do it. But it, it kind of allows me to, to focus on something and, and throw myself into something that is going to yield results, but is not work related, right? As much as I'm very project management driven, I always kind of have been that sort of individual. It's a way to do something in my personal life that's going to benefit me and, and my family and, and it's something that we're really looking forward to, but it's also something I can really kind of get my teeth into. Um, and there's the, obviously, you know, the, the physical exercise element to it as well. Um, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been an interesting couple of weeks, but it's, uh, it's been really fun. Brilliant. I mean, an ideal mix of, of, of laughter, exercise and carpentry um, for good self-care <laughs> tips. So thank you all for that. Um, Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts on the um, all the poll results um, today. I'm, I'm going to take us into um, just answering a few questions that we've had in from the audience. Um, I'm, I'm going to start and I, I'm probably going to direct this um, back to Andy to start with, but would love to hear Matt and Olive's thoughts on it as well. Um, a, a few people have written around um, with us working more remotely and I guess teams not being physically connected um, in an office space how are we able to adapt or how are managers able to adapt in terms of spotting the signs and symptoms um, of, of somebody possibly suffering with mental health issues and um, whilst we all work remotely yeah i think it's a really difficult one i think even you know even managers who are the, at the absolute peak of being able to to deal in health and well-being issues face to face uh, have been struggling um i mean look, without wanting to suggest very generalized advice i think ultimately Regular catch-ups are an absolute must, right? And I'm sure most people are doing them. Um, tracking language is a real good one. Um, something that really helped me actually in the time when I when I was away from work was that my manager had been tracking the language that I was using. I, I didn't realise that he knew. Just picking up on some key phrases that maybe I was saying, and also asking me the same question around something that was happening, whether it was a, you know how my personal life was or how things were at work, but asking me the same question regularly in different one-to-ones, in different calls that we would have, um, and, and really taking note of how my answer was changing. Um, being able to, to spot signs doesn't necessarily mean, I think, that you're going to have a single conversation with an individual and be able to immediately identify that something is wrong. I think a lot of the time, it's something that needs to be addressed over a long period, um, not necessarily a long period, but over a period of time um, to be able to spot changes. Um, I also think that, again, honesty and openness from managers goes a long way to, to helping those signs not only to be to be spotted, but also to be spoken about by an individual that may be struggling. And, and again, I come back to storytelling, right? And, and if managers are, are open enough on a one to one call, for example, with a, an employee by not just asking that employee how they are, but giving the employee a, a window into that manager's life to be able to say, well, you know, today I felt X, Y, Z, and, and this has happened to me, and it's, it's been a bit of a challenge, but I've, you know, I've done this to be able to, to bring myself out of it. I think just, again, allowing that kind of human side to come through really will instill the confidence in individuals and employees to be able to actually start those conversations with their managers or feel safe enough to be able to maybe drop something into a conversation that can be, that can take it from some like a hidden sign to something that's really obvious. Um, just the last thing I'll say again, just referring back to my own situation, I wanted my manager to spot the signs in me. I didn't want to have to be the person to say that I thought that something was wrong. Um, and as I say, you know, constantly checking in, constantly asking similar questions to be able to track the progress of an individual really does go a long way into to giving a manager the ability to do that. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Um, Matt or Olive, do you have any further uh, thoughts to add to that? I think, I think um, again, spot on, Andy. Um, the, the only thing I'd say beyond what Andy said, and I, I think Andy's nailed the real priorities, um, but just on the basis of that openness and that preparedness of leaders to be a little vulnerable and talk about their own circumstances, that can have a, a galvanising effect across a team, um, as well as on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, and if, as a team, um, you feel that you've built a sort of community where people are there to look out for each other as well, I think there is um, potential benefit that team members keep an eye on each other and, and it's not just on the manager to, to spot something. Um, now I appreciate there's a fine line there, some people wouldn't want to necessarily say something behind somebody's back, there's all those sorts of things that could come into it, but I think with the right sort of environment, the right sort of trust within the team, then, then actually just somebody saying, 
I don't know if you knew, but X, Y, and Z to the manager could be massively helpful. And, and, I, and I think there's definitely a level of skill uh, and time investment required from the leader to create that environment of trust. Yeah, thank you. And that, and I just add to that as well. Um, I think there needs to be also a commitment from managers um, to the staff, possibly in terms of training all staff to have a basic awareness of mental health awareness. Because I think one of the things around just spotting one person and picking about the issue makes that individual become a target. And if you've been vulnerable already, somebody then saying that you've got mental health is, is going to illness is going to make it even worse. Um, and I'm saying that because when I first did mental health first day training. For me, um, we had issues in our family about mental health issues, but we didn't put mental health because again, language is another import, important thing. We didn't know it was mental health, it was something that happened within a cultural basis. However, by learning, by doing this training, it gave me languages that I didn't have before. It gave me a better understanding that I didn't have before. And it made me feel able to have that conversation, reflect back on how I've how I've treated or behaved in the past around somebody who may be in, be in distress. And so if you commit to training all staff rather than picking out the individual, it would be a lot better than saying, we're gonna do it just because so-and-so is unwell. Um, because then it just takes it away then and it makes that person, and particularly within BME communities, uh, mental health and stigma um, for black communities is even higher. So to actually own up to somebody, if you're not talking very well that you've got mental health issues, means you're going to retract even further back. So, yeah, for me, it is about commitment to your start, your team, about learning or having an awareness about some of the basic mental health issues. Brilliant. Thanks, Olive. Thank you all so much um, for, your, for your thoughts on that. Um, I, I have a question um, from somebody in the audience who said that their organisation is reopening um, offices on the 1st of September and all staff are meant to be going back into kind of the physical workspace. Um, however, there's naturally a lot of anxiety um, around wanting, wanting to go um, and possibly do employees have the right to choose where they'd like to work as the current pandemic um, continues. Um, is there any advice in terms of how employees can approach managers to have that conversation around um the the i guess the need and the want to still work remotely during this time i'm going to open that up to anybody who would like to answer it on the panel well I, I, i'll just chip in with a couple of thoughts on that um Vicky. I, I think it's um i think it's very um potentially risky on the part of any employer um, to insist on people coming back into an office space, uh, particularly if it's been demonstrated over recent months that those roles can be done perfectly adequately uh, remotely. I, I, I think every organisation and the leadership of the organisation has got an obligation to think very carefully about uh, how returns to work happen. Uh, everybody obviously has the right formally to apply for flexible working arrangements for one, for one another, but I guess I think the question refers to the 1st of September, so time is at the essence here. Um, I, I think that if I were in that position, um, I'd be thinking that, OK, yeah, the, the journey to work, as, as Andy has outlined earlier on, being a potential risk, but, but actually being in an office space for an eight hour day or whatever that looks like, um, that is different to popping into a local supermarket where you, you, you know, you're in proximity to people for a very limited period of time. If you're with people for that prolonged period, uh, there must be risks that that organisation considers there. So, uh, on a personal level, and certainly what we're intending to do with our staff team CMI, and we would recommend is that you don't insist, particularly where there are vulnerabilities for individuals, um, or where it's perfectly possible to, uh, to you know, fulfil your role and your objectives um, from home. I think I'd also add as well that it's incumbent both on the uh, organisation to not to justify necessarily, but to be able to set out exactly what the rationale is for, for insisting that people go back to the office. And also actually uh, uh, incumbent on the, the part of the individual to be able to demonstrate why there isn't necessarily um, the need for them to be in the office space. I know, you know, many of us have probably spoken 
uh, in the past couple of weeks and months about how, how much more productive we've been and the additional time we're able to spend um, addressing work because we're not having to commute and, and things like that. And I think, again, it comes back to, to mutual respect, but also back to honesty, right? That if, if, if an individual really does have a, a genuine concern about traveling to an office or, or indeed being in an office for a long period of time, we need to make sure that we're having those conversations and we're having them with our line managers, but we're also ensuring that those conversations are being taken further. So if you, know, if you ask a line manager point blank that you want them to refer your concerns to their manager and, vice, and you know, maybe further up the chain, that the voices of those individuals who do have a genuine concern and even if it's not necessarily a, a genuine concern, I'm choosing my language very carefully here, but you know, if, it, if it's maybe an irrational concern, right, about coming back simply because of the, the still the continued amount of, of misinformation and, and, and lack of concrete information, as it were, um, around what the situation is right now. I think, again, honesty, openness, having those conversations and feeling confident to have those conversations um, and to be able to demonstrate, as we've said, that, that productivity doesn't have to mean being sat in an office space for eight hours a day. Uh, I think that's key. And I think those conversations should continue. Um, and there should be, you know, even if it's a, a viewed like a return to work after illness, right? If it's a phased return, maybe it's a case that there's trial days, right? You get the opportunity to come to the office maybe for a day just to see how it is, to allay any fears that you may have. Um, I think it all comes down to openness and honesty with conversation. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I would just I would support Andy on that as well um, because I think when you're in a situation where you've been on your own outside for such a long time and been asked to go back into the office, people are going to be naturally frightened, and you don't know what you're going back into, and therefore. Um, it, we've seen it can be work where people can work from home and some people may enjoy working from home some people may enjoy going back but the phrase return to work is an important thing if need be or look at another way around of, of, of doing that and I think communication as was said before is really important because if you're not talking to your if you're talking to your staff regularly you will have an understanding of where they are and I think one of the things Andy was saying about being disbelieved is such a thing because if, if a, um, from the in my community, for example, or someone who's got a disability, that a hidden disability like mental health, and never disclosed it beforehand, and as this, this um, being at home has raised it, you can't, you don't know how to raise that with your manager, and you're not having the relationship that manager that will go unsaid, and therefore persons, people vote, vote with their feet and then just leave the job, as opposed to actually having to tackle with the issues. I think that, that, that step by step, each individual person, as opposed to um, everybody much much together is important. Take one person and deal with it. As we talk about mental health issues, it's an individual journey that person has to go through. It's the same thing when we're going back into work. It's an individual journey and we don't know what that person's had to manage before they're coming back. Brilliant. Thank you all so much um, for your um, thoughts on that. Um, I'm very conscious of time so I am going to bring the session to a close. Um, I want to end by saying a massive thank you to our panel today um, for taking the time to share um, your expertise um, on the topic of mental health in the workplace and highlighting the crucial role that people managers play in that. I hope this session has inspired you to continue driving open conversations about mental health within your own workplace. Um, and if you are looking at ways to increase confidence and skills across your people managers, um, we are pleased to share that we are actually launching a mental health skills for managers course, um, which will be launching next week. And there are further details on our website. Um, if you would like any kind of further information on resources, I think there is a slide up now, which you can refer to. And these slides will be sent to anybody that's attended the webinar this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again for our brilliant panellists.